Well, we've got it as cold as a refrigerator in here, right? Yesterday at this time, it was starting to smell like the boys' locker room. All right, everyone needs a handout and something to write with. All right, I'm going to give this book away, Journey to Authenticity. Uh, we're, going to do, we're not going to do this random whoever puts their hand up thing. If you are 44 years old and willing to admit it, I want to give this book to you. Now, if there's more than one 44-year-old in this room, we're going to... Okay, you're 44 and willing to admit it. You're 44 and willing to admit it, and you are too. Now, of these three people, what, whose birthday is the closest? If you're 44 years old, whose birthday is the closest to today's date? You're wrong. You're disqualified. See, the mind is the first to go. October? August. August? Okay, help me. Who's closer? Why, why did I give a book to a 44-year-old? Did you know that statistically, 44 is the saddest year of your life? True story. It is. You have something to look forward to. Wow, this is really fantastic. Why are all you guys here? Were, did someone tell you to come here? Were you referred here? Did someone say, that's a pretty good one? Okay, good. Uh, my name is Sonny Mazar, and uh, my wife Becky and I have been in ministry for th over 30 years in local church ministry. We're now helping the Radiant Network, helping with pastoral care. Our heart is to serve those who serve and minister to those who minister and equip those who equip. And one of the ways we put it is we help pastors do ministry without losing their own soul. And so I've been loving, as I know you have been loving, some of the things we've been learning in this seminar, in this conference. Hasn't it been great? Yes. It's been really good. And uh, so we've been married 32 years and we have four children. This picture is already outdated because we don't have three grandchildren. We actually have four grandchildren now. And Becky's not here because she's watching the grandkids. Isn't she amazing? And so these are our four. And uh, all three of our kids, uh, all three of our four kids are married except for this beautiful woman right here. That's Erin. It's our 25-year-old daughter. And if you're a young man eligible... <laughs> And interested, come see me at the end of the, the talk today. You must meet certain criteria, of course. It's going to be a long interviewing process. It, it's, it's grueling, is what it is. It's grueling. Well, let's pray as we, as we come. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, our brother and our friend. And Lord, I thank you that this room is full of people who are hungry to learn about spiritual identity, spiritual authenticity, the passages of our spiritual life. And Lord, I pray that you would come and be the great teacher today, that you would go way beyond what I could ever do, and that you would impart, Holy Spirit, the very thing that is needed in each one of these unique lives here just impart that unique nugget of truth to them so that they can have light on their journey in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 All right. Uh, we are going to take a journey together. When our kids were much younger, we took an out west vacation from the great state of Minnesota where we were pastoring and we still live there uh, all the way 1,600 miles to the Grand Canyon. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? Raise your hand. Oh, okay, about a third of us have been there. Isn't that amazing? I mean, pictures cannot do it justice, but we drove 
for days and days, and we stopped, of course, along the way, if, as you have to do with kids, keep them entertained, and you stop. But I had ho- pre-booked hotel reservations near, very near the Grand Canyon. The problem was, we were arriving at night, I was very tired, and I, I was a man, and I was not willing to admit that I was lost. <laughs> I was momentarily disoriented. There's a big difference, okay? There's a big difference. I was not lost. So I was frustrated. And it was like one of those real dark nights. And, but I knew we were close to the hotel because we had passed the sign that said Grand Canyon National Park. And we drove past the sign and we were driving in trying to find, where's our hotel? And suddenly I stopped that minivan and I said, kids, Wait a minute. It was like a moment of revelation. I looked on this side, and there was some picnic tables, a, a little outhouse, and some, a little light over there. But I looked out that side of the car, and it was a sea of vast blackness. And I said, kids, we are here. You can't see it, but we were literally so close to the rim of the Grand Canyon, you could have taken a rock and thrown it over the, the edge of the Grand Canyon. We were that close. Why do I tell you that story? Because the Grand Canyon by day looks like this, but the Grand Canyon by night looks a lot like this. And sometimes in our spiritual journey, we can be very close to something awesome that God is introducing to us, but we, because we don't have light for it, we don't understand the grandeur of it. And so it's my prayer that as we're talking right now, that there's going to become some light on the Grand Canyon that God has you standing right next to. So we're going to go on a journey, and this journey involves different seasons and passages of time. And what we're going to actually talk about today takes a lifetime to fulfill. Some of the principles we're talking about are mystical. And, and we, we only get to different places in God as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We cannot fast forward this process. The best we can do is cooperate with God in the process. All right, here is um, a great uh, jumping off point in Psalm 84. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a journey to a sacred place. Do you know that you're blessed if you understand that your spiritual life has movement? Built into your spiritual uh, reality is movement. And when we lead someone to Christ, we should be careful to tell them, welcome to the beginning of your journey. And it's going to change and morph and grow. And God's going to do amazing things in you and through you. But it's only the beginning. Happy spiritual birthday. Blessed are you if you understand that your heart is on a pilgrimage. It implies movement. Now, as we, it says here, as they pass through the valley of Baca, this Hebrew word Baca means weeping. How many of you have passed through on your journey some valleys of weeping? Yeah, it's like, God, where are you, and why am I in this valley, and what in the world is going on? I thought I was going to have this wonderful spiritual experience. But God is faithful. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Even in our valley, he prepares a table for us. So, And then it says they go from strength to strength until each one appears before God in Zion. Now, this is important. We go from strength to strength as we grow. The New Testament says we go from glory to glory. We go from faith to faith. There's a movement of strength to strength, glory to glory. And this is what it looks like. We go from one strength to a new strength. That doesn't make that strength bad, wrong, or immature. It was the strength for that season. We go from strength to another strength to another strength to another strength. Each are valid. And each are a grace given us in God. And so when we're talking about journey, we're talking about going from strength to strength. Now, Augustine said this, people travel to wonder at the height of the mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the river, at the vast compass of the ocean, and the circular motion of the stars. 
and they pass by themselves without wondering. I want to tell you, you are fearfully, wonderfully made. And a lot of times we think about that in the physical body. Obviously we are. But spiritually and your soul is also wonderfully put together. And so, yeah, we can look at the Grand Canyon. We can marvel at various things. But today, we're just going to pause for 60 minutes, and we're going to wonder at the work of God in you. Uh, Mr. Huxley, Dr. Huxley, I don't agree with him. He's an atheist, and I, I don't agree with his worldview, but I thought this quote was amazing and very challenging. If most of us remain ignorant of ourselves, it's because uh, self-knowledge is painful and we prefer the pleasures of illusion. So self-knowledge is sometimes a scary thing. Have you ever had God pull the curtain back on your own heart? You're like, ouch, that was really ugly. I prefer illusion. No, let's move and say, God, bring me into the light as I move along on this journey. All right. Now, in your handout notes, you see this page. It's page two there. Turn it sideways. Get ready to draw on this. This page we're going to spend most of our time on. And what I'm going to have you do is draw in your own pen and your own hand your map, a map. When I was a kid being raised in church, I would doodle in church if I was bored. I would draw pictures of the funniest looking choir member. I would draw pictures of the pastor because I was bored in church. Doodle, doodle on the back of the hymnal or uh, something to write on. <laughs> hymnal. Well, you're going to be writing t t today, but it's not because you're bored, but because you're drawing a map. And let's begin. Take your pen and draw the first line coming up from below the cross, piercing th right through the cross and into the above that double parallel line. And for those of you listening by audio, which is why we have the recording device here, I apologize uh, that this is only audio, but if you want a digital um, printout or a copy of this map, go to www.journeytoauthenticity.com and there is a copy of this map with a lot of other helpful videos and downloads. <laughs> journeytoauthenticity.com. All right, label this stage one new life. This is where our journey begins. In stage one is when we came to Christ for salvation. We came to the cross, didn't we? We left our past behind. We said, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I come to the old rugged cross, you know, and I need to, to have that sin forgiven and I want to become part of your family. This is a very exciting starting point for your journey. You realize that God's your father and your sins are forgiven. You're filled with awe and wonder. But for each of these stages, hear me, for each of these stages, there's strengths and there's weaknesses. We unpack this in greater detail in uh, the book. By the way, shameless commercial. We have some books available uh, for a reduced rate of $10. You can buy them on Amazon for $14 or $15. They're $10 right here. Uh, they are called Journey to Authenticity. Built in each chapter is like a small group study guide at the end of each chapter. So if you want to do this with a, a group, a small group. This book has been translated into four languages. And uh, we've taught this around the world. And God continues to give perspective on people's journey. Because perspective is power. All right, we're in stage one. This is what scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You know this verse. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You also know Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation when you are in Christ. This is why this stage is so wonderful, is because you realize you're a child of God, you're not under the, the condemnation, and you're beginning to explore this new creation life. All right. On your map. Please label these two zones. The one below the double parallel line, label it despised self. Up here, label this ideal self. Now there's a reason why we have to make sure this is clear. Because when we, when we came to Christ, we, we left our despised self with all of its baggage and bondages and sin and brokenness. And we began to, right here, experience a realm we never thought was possible. We're calling that ideal self. All right, 
get ready to draw stage two like this, stair steps, and label it stage two learner. Everyone say learner. Learner. Learner is drawn like stair steps because when you're going upstairs, there is a rise and a run to every staircase, a rise and a run. Any carpenters in here ever build stair stringers? Let me see your hand. All right, if you've ever built stair stringers, you know how important it is to carefully measure the rise and the run if you want to pass code, right? Rise and run, and it has to be consistent. When we are in stage two learner, yes, we've been to stage one, we've been saved. We are like dry sponges. We want to learn all that God has for us. We, we open the Bible, and we're at the church every time the church doors are open. We sign up for every small group. We're, we want to learn. And... We draw this like stair steps because the rise of the stairs is when you learn a new truth. The run is when you apply it to your life. The rise is when you learn a new truth. The run is when you actually apply it to your life. For example, you come to church here, Pastor Lee preaches a great sermon on the virtue of patience. How patience is a fruit of the Spirit. And then you pray the most dangerous prayer you've ever prayed. Lord, make me a patient person. And the Lord spends the next nine months of your life giving you opportunity to exercise patience. People cut in front of you in traffic. People offend you. You have to wait in super long lines. Uh, you know, the checkout person there is super slow. And what is happening there is if you cooperate with the dealings of God in stage two, learner, we're talking about your progress on your journey. This is when people start coming up to you and saying, wait a minute. You're ch different. You've changed. You used to be like this, and now you don't act that way anymore. Isn't that exciting? The rise and the run. Learn the truth, apply the truth. Now, this is, this is a danger because sometimes we think that Christianity is learning truths. The book of James says, do not just know the truth and deceive yourself. Do what it says. So James hits us hard in learning, doing, learning, doing. By the way, if you try to skip up these stairs, hopscotch, jump over some stairs, warning, Will Robinson. It will show up later in your Christian walk as character deficits. Don't rush through this wonderful, vitally important stage. That's why Jesus said, I'm going away. Go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So when you're in stage two learner, you're insatiably hungry. And learn all you can. Now, scripture says uh, to stage two learners in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And that's what's going on. We're growing up in our salvation. All right, get ready. Does your map look like this so far? Let me look around the class. Okay, no one's sleeping. Get ready to draw stage three. It looks like this. Stage three takes us higher into the realm of our ideal self than any other stage. And when you draw it, make sure you draw these peaks and these valleys ever increasing in size and label it stage three warrior. Why do we draw warrior like this? The peaks, you see these peaks? The peaks for a warrior are every battle we win. The valleys are our defeats. And you know what? When we are warriors, we have both victories and defeats. But when we're warriors, when we're defeated, knocked to the floor, we're like a rubber ball. If I were to take a rubber ball and throw it down to the ground, guess what? It would bounce up even higher. Wow. And when we're warriors, we're pretty much unstoppable. We get knocked down. We say, oh, the devil beat me up that time. But I pick up my sword. Jesus, show me the next uh, you know, hill to take for you. Where's the next giant to slay? I am your warrior. See, warriors are about accomplishment. And, and, and church history is full of great stories where warriors have accomplished and done so many exploits. We owe so much to warriors. Unfortunately, too often in church, we mistreat our warriors. You know what we do? We pat them on the head and say, you know what, honey? 
you're a little bit too overzealous. Why don't you go sit in the corner so you don't hurt anybody and come back to us when your faith is lukewarm like the rest of us? No, we need to help our warriors and say, we're going to feed you jet fuel. Now, in wisdom, we are going to give you some parameters and some guidance, okay? You need to be able to not crash the car if you're going to drive it. Keep it on the road, but here's my lesson for you. Go for it, and we're going to help empower you. Church history is full of this. Martin Luther was a warrior when he nailed the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg door, wasn't he? People stood up. Great things, great injustices have been righted by warriors. Warriors are both women and men. You don't have to be a man to be a warrior. You, you, you mess with uh, something that a woman is uh, passionate about, you will see a warrior princess. <laughs> What's her name, Zena or something like that? Something like that? Yeah. So you will see, mess with, uh, mess with her kids, you will see a warrior. Uh, mess with a truth that she's passionate about, you will see a warrior. This is a male and female experience. We are warriors. And what does scripture say? 1 John 2. Do you, have you ever read 1 John 2 where John says, I write to you children, young men, and fathers? And he repeats them each, doesn't he? These are not age designations. They are spiritual life stage designations. Don't miss this. Go back and reread it. I write to you children, young men, and fathers. And what he writes to them, what he says to them, applies to spiritual life stages. Now for stage two, warrior, young men, you're strong and the word of God lives in you and you've overcome the evil one. This is what it's all about when we're warriors. And here's David on one of his manic days. And we know that David had his manic days and his depressed days. Just read the book of Psalms. Amen. And here, it, with your help, God, you know, I can advance against the troop and I can leap over a wall. There's nothing that's going to stop me with you, God, because I am your warrior. Semper Fi. <laughs> All right. Now let's just pause right here and say that probably nothing that I've just said is new to you. Because the church does very well at talking about these first three stages of our spiritual journey. Think about it. Come to Jesus for salvation, be born again, stage one, new life. Read your Bible and learn of God's word and his ways, right? Become a disciple, read the Bible. And then number three, leverage your gifts to advance the kingdom. And serve in the church, serve out of the church. And we think we're successful because we've helped people through their spiritual life stages. Eh, wrong. We've only helped them through the first three. We don't talk about stages four, five, and six very much, if at all. Why? They're not glamorous. We often don't even have a theology for them. I call them the silent stages because we just don't talk about them in church. You see, the teaching of Journey to Authenticity grew out of the dark night of the soul that I went through. I was pastoring a successful church, a growing church, multi-staff church. Wonderful things were happening. In the church, I had no reason to be sad or depressed. As a matter of fact, as a warrior pastor... I actually said from the pulpit once, for you people who are depressed, I hope you get over it because this church is moving forward. I mean, wasn't I a compassionate pastor? I was so compassionate. I was a warrior. And for warriors, one of the weaknesses of warriors is we are insensitive to the weaknesses of others. Okay. It, this teaching grew out of the, a dark night of the soul that I went through. Suddenly, my faith didn't work like it used to. Uh, I felt myself falling out of the sky and I wasn't sure if I would crash the plane right into the ground. And I didn't understand it. And it was, it was something I wrote in my journal. I literally wrote some of the key points of this whole teaching in my journal and closed it for two years and didn't even talk to anyone about it. Pro I thought probably half of this is heresy. I dare not share it with anyone. 
but in the course of time, I began to talk about these truths to mature Christians. They said, Sonny, this is not only true, but the rest of the body of Christ needs to hear it. So that's a little background on where this all came from. The church does great at stages one, two, and three, but let us introduce you now to stages four, five, and six. They are just as spiritual. I don't think you believe me. Stages four, five, and six are just as spiritual, just as God led. Get ready. Begin to draw stage four like this. I told you it was just as spiritual. Now don't laugh. Now, when you draw the, the beginning stage four, draw this dotted line south of the, the um, bottom parallel because it's optional. Any, any line that you see that's, that's dotted is optional. Please don't take it. Don't take it. All right. Do you remember Passion Week when Jesus was uh, being arrested and uh, was heading to the cross? His disciples fled. Judas betrayed him. Judas took a fall. Now remember, Judas traveled with Jesus for those three years. He saw the miracles. He heard the teachings. All right, he was part of all of that stuff. When Judas took his fall, he kept going. And if you've been in ministry for any length of time, as a pastor or a leader in a church, you've seen people who were once glorious warriors who have taken a fall. They've been offended. They've been hurt. Something has happened in their life. And they have fired God, they have fired his church, they get cynical, and they take a nosedive. And, and you're like trying to help them, but they keep going. They keep this, the dotted line, they keep going into some very dark and terrible places. However, complete writing uh, out what this stage looks like and label it stage four brokenness. Now, when you draw brokenness, Make the, it kind of looks like an electrocardiogram, doesn't it? Make the, the top of it pierce above the top parallel line and the bottom, some of those bottoms pierce below the bottom parallel line. And then when you draw it, have that electrocardiogram kind of taper down and taper down smaller and smaller. Here's why. When we are in brokenness, it is a place of tremendous confusion. Yeah. It's a, tr a place of tremendous um, vulnerability to the devil, let's just be honest. We're vulnerable, our faith doesn't make sense anymore. You know what? I went from being a warrior to this broken, confused person. God, where are you and why is this happening to me? Let me make something perfectly clear right now. Brokenness is not spiritual failure. Brokenness can lead to spiritual failure but you can continue and you should continue to minister even through brokenness. I was teaching this some years ago in the great state of Texas and there was a pastor sitting off to my right. He was probably 65 years old. And he said, now that you have taught through the journey, I understand what I've been going through for the last 10 years. And I thought to myself, dear God, can, can this brokenness stage last for a decade? The fact is it can and this good, faithful pastor continued to preach, pray, worship, marry, bury, counsel, all the stuff, even though his soul was a wreck. This is why we like the Psalms. We go to the Psalms because they help give a nomenclature to the things that we're afraid to say even out loud. All right. Brokenness is drawn like this because it describes what Peter went through. Remember, Judas took this. Peter, it says after he denied that he even knew Christ, what did he do? He went out and he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly because he was disappointed in God. He was confused about God's plan. Why is this happening? I was your sword swinging warrior. Now I've denied you to a servant girl that I even knew you three times I denied you. It's okay to go out and weep bitterly. Because brokenness, while it is not spiritual failure, it is a birthing time. It is a birthing of something new in your life. If you'll allow me, it's a, it's a coming home. It's a coming home time. And I'm going to unpack that in just a second. 
See, when we're in brokenness, we're bouncing around like a ping pong ball, up and down. And look, look, at some of these peaks, we think, you know what? I'm going to regain my warrior self again. Yeah. I'm going to recover. This is just a bad battle I'm going through. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to soar with the eagles again. And then the next day, you're quite sure you're demon-possessed and you need the elders. <laughs> Send, God, send the elders to anoint me with oil because I've got seven demons in me. And it's like, no, I'm not okay. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I can be okay. And, and we're, 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 we're buffeted between, look it, what are we buffeted between? Our despised self is calling to us. And our ideal self is saying, come, come back to the glory days again. And here's what we learn in stage four, that living in ideal self was never meant to be an eternal reality. I know that might mess with your theology. A lot of charismatics don't like this teaching because we think that ideal self warrior is the zenith and the ultimate of spiritual vitality. It's a wonderful part of it, but it's not the whole picture. And when I say we're coming home, let's, let's look at the scripture. Simon, Simon, this is Jesus to Peter, right? Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Hey, what happens when we sift wheat? We get rid of the what? So that the what can remain? The pure grain. The usable, eatable, pure grain. So sifting is actually a good thing. So Peter... Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. Isn't it interesting that the creator of the universe didn't tell Peter, Peter, you're my homeboy. I'm going to tell the devil to to keep his hands off of you. He didn't say that. He said, Peter, I'm going to pray for you. You're going to go through this tribulum. You're going to go through it, and I'm going to pray that your faith may not fail because it's going to do something beautiful in you, Peter. If your faith does not fail, watch this. On the other side, you're going to come back and strengthen the brothers like you've never been able to strengthen them before. See, it was this same Peter who said, all these losers might deny you, Jesus, but I'm your sword-swinging warrior, and I will never deny you. And then on the other side of this brokenness experience, Jesus meets him on the beach, feeds him all a lunch, supernatural lunch. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Come on, let's get, let's pair everything else off. Let's get all the baggage off. And let's go back to rebuilding your, uh, from all that brokenness that removed all your, your pride and self-strength. Now, Peter, do you love me? Take care of my little lambs. Isn't it wonderful? That Jesus could trust Peter to take care of his little lambs without making them lamb chops. Because if he would have been taking care of lambs over here, he would have been, you know, yeah. lamb chop supper forever. Same is true with you and me. When I was a warrior pastor, I was a hard-charging type A, D on the disc profile type guy. I was going for it, and we were seeing a lot of spiritual fruit. Glorious. I was a glorious warrior. But you know what? I turned around in those days, and I saw a lot of bodies behind me. I saw a lot of people who, you know, the most dangerous person... When, when, you're, when you're in stage four brokenness, the most dangerous person to be around in church, a warrior. Because you're there bleeding on the ground, confused, and, and you don't know why. You can't get up, and you don't have strength to get up. A warrior runs by and says, get up, or I'll run you through with my sword. All right. You'll be able to strengthen your brothers when you come through this thing. And here is what I want you to now draw on your map. Why do I say brokenness is a coming home? Please draw this. Authentic self lives between the double parallel lines. Get this. Authentic self is a third dimension. You see, we've spent half the first half of our Christian life thinking there's two dimensions, the good and the bad. The despised self, which we knew that was bondage, right? Bondage to sin, bondage to all these uh, terrible things that we used to be a part of. But when we are going through stage four, we realize that, to be honest with you, some of ideal self was bondage. Bondage to self-strength, bondage to selfish ambition, bondage to to self-motivation, all of that stuff is 
being pared from our life. And the Lord says, I don't want you to go back to despise self. And you cannot stay in ideal self. Get ready. I'm going to introduce you because something new is going to be birthed in you. It's an introduction to the new thing I'm trying to show you. And I'm calling it authentic self. What is our working definition for authenticity? I'm going to use my hands for this because I I love the, the, the hand illustration. Authenticity is when the real God merges with the real you. The real God merges and is expressed through the real you. Not some facsimile of who you thought God was, but the real God merges with the real you. Real you. Not... Mother Teresa, not Billy Graham, you. When the real God is expressed through the real you, authenticity. This is one of the mysteries of the gospel. Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's amazing. It's you with all of your uniqueness. You're totally different than the person sitting next to you. So God wants to be expressed through you uniquely. Authenticity. Don't apologize for who you've been become. So authentic self is here. And look at this. According to this graph, when we're going through brokenness, now it doesn't feel like this at the moment, but we're actually closer to meeting our ideal self, our authentic, authentic self than we ever have been. When we're going through brokenness, God's saying, let me introduce you to someone. <laughs> it's your authentic self. Let's try it out. Now, I want to talk to you about some parking lots. Two parking lots I'm going to teach you about. Because stage four is so painful and confusing, we invent ways to get out of it. We do not like the the pain. We don't like the time. We don't like the confusion. We love being a warrior, and we, we want out. It's like, God, I didn't sign up for this. I'm pulling off the road. What is a parking lot? A parking lot is when you stop your journey. You pull off into a comfortable place. You find a a clear lane. You pull in. You put it in park. You turn off your motor, and your journey is stopped. I believe that 60% of the body of Christ is in one of these two parking lots, not moving. (laughs) Stuck. Started a journey and got stuck in the journey. All right, let's, let's draw them. Again, a dotted line. Off the bottom of stage four, a dotted line. Why is it dotted? Because it's optional. Please don't take it. You don't have to take it. And draw that little space, what? Carnal Christianity. This is what we would define as a backslidden Christian. Someone who says, you know what? I didn't sign up for this. I used to be a warrior. Didn't work out too well. People in this parking lot are self-medicating on old sin. They're like, God, I hope I go to heaven when I die, but I'll tell you what, you leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. I want off. A lot of people die without moving any further. They've had a wonderful spiritual experience in their past. Something has happened. And because this has been so confusing, they pull off, they sit down in their lazy boy and they say, done. We call it carnal Christianity. The other is a little bit more difficult to to define because it looks so good. I said it looks so good. Go ahead and draw this off of one of the peaks of stage four and label it pseudo-spirituality. What does pseudo mean? False, fake, and phony. Pseudo-spirituality, people who are in this parking lot, where, where does this live? This doesn't live down in despise self. These people are trying to regain their glory days, and they're trying to fake it till they make it. Their pseudo-spirituality, pseudo is fake spirituality. They're trying to regain the reality of their ideal self because they think that that is what victorious faith looks like. People living in pseudo-spirituality are oftentimes, they want you to be impressed with their spiritual giftedness. They, uh, they usually cannot find a church spiritual enough for them to attend. If the pastor of that church tries to speak any correction to them, they bolt. 
these people are under the spirit of weirdness. <laughs> because they have launched into facsimilating a way of relating to God while avoiding the very dealings of God in their inner life. Charismatics and Pentecostals, we're great at this. Because we think that faith has to always look this way. When really we want to say, wait a minute, would you just put that stuff down and let's deal with what's really going on in your soul and let the Lord have his way in there because you don't have to kind of regain that glory because there's an authenticity the Lord's trying to uh, introduce you to and you don't have to try to be that one flaming torch that you used to be. I call, as a pastor, I, I started calling these people the granola crowd. You know what granola is? It's a gathering of fruits, flakes, and nuts. And, and that's what these people are. They get very flaky. And uh, that's the granola crowd. And, and you just want to stand on terra firma and say, come back to us. We love you. Let's just be real. And yeah. let's, let's walk together through brokenness. I know it's hurtful. I know it's confusing. But you don't have to pretend like that. Come on. Parking lot avoidance. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. We just heard this preach this morning. Work out your salvation, not work for your salvation, with fear and trembling. Question, when was the last time you literally had fear and trembling over the work of God in your life? It's biblical to be full of such conviction that God, I, I don't know what's going on here, but I need to cooperate with you. I'm undone. Mm -hmm. Work it out with fear and trembling. Why? Because it's the devil who is at work. Is that what the Bible says? Yeah. Wait a minute. What does this verse say? Who's at work? It's, it's, it's that nasty boss of yours that's at work in you. That's why you're all messed up. <laughs> it's your spouse. See, when we're going through stage four, we blame other people for our problems. Yeah. And we even blame, blame the devil for our problems. The fact is that oftentimes we don't even have a theology for what we're going through. When I was a young pastor for the first half of my ministry, I didn't think that this was biblical or real. Like I said before, I thought it was heresy. And I, I thought if this, only, if this happened, it only happened to weak people. It's certainly not going to happen to me. It happens to spiritual losers, weak people. But it's God who is at work in you. You know what? People who are in the parking lots are fighting God. They're fighting the workings of God. But they're clinging to their gifts or they're clinging to their, their uh, medicating sins, whatever it is. But it is actually God who is at work in you, what? To will and to act according to his good purpose. All right. Here we go. Stage five looks like a cross. Remember when I had you draw stage four as tapering down like that? Everything that has happened in stage four brokenness, by the grace of God, if you cooperate, is leading you to stage five surrender. It's a cross. You know what? There are two crosses in Christianity. The first is the cross of salvation that Jesus died on to save you. The second cross is a cross of surrender that you get to die on. You really do. Jesus said, hey, if you're going to be my follower, pick up your cross, follow me. Don't be surprised at this. This cross of surrender is a place of great stillness, a great uh, bit of immobility, and we pray prayers like Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And we have to forgive because a lot of times in our brokenness experience, there have been people involved and we have to make sure we're forgiving them. We pray prayers like Jesus prayed, God, why have you forsaken me? Why in the world is this happening to me? Unless you come through, I'll never live again. Do you know that this subject of death to self and mortification of our carnal life has been written a lot about, about a lot in church history. Watchman Nee. How many of you have ever read Watchman Nee? Any of his stuff? 
oh, wow, introduce yourself to the writings of Watchman Nee. Um, because he's, he talks a lot about this. But here's the thing. A lot of times when people think about death to their self, they think, because I'm a high achiever Christian, I'm going to make this happen. Because I'm going to cooperate with the will of God. So we get a hammer and three long nails. And we go to that proverbial cross. We put our feet together. We drive in the first nail. Bam, bam, bam. And we say, ow. <laughs> and we take the second nail and we hold it with this hand. And we take the hammer and go, bam, bam, bam. Ah. Oh, oh this self-crucifixion is terrible. It's painful. But I'm going to get it done, God. Yeah. And then we realize we got a problem. Who's going to drive in the last nail? That's when God sends your enemies and some of your friends. Who are very good with a hammer and nail, by the way. And they do you a great service. And you get to die like Jesus and say, I'm not going to be bitter. Lord, forgive them. I'm not talking about a victim mentality. I'm just saying whatever it is that's trying to fight, prove, defend, all that stuff. You see what's happening in stage four is a brokenness, much like a, a, a stallion needs to be broken, right? You see a stallion running around, strong and virile. But if that stallion is ever going to be trained to pull the carriage of the king, it has to go through something we call brokenness. Breaking of all of its self-strength. Being willing to lay down the very gifts of strength that it has so that on the other side there might be something new. Let me tell you something hopeful, friend. For every cross you experience in Jesus, there is a resurrection on the other side. I'm going to say that again. For every cross you experience in Jesus, there is a resurrection on the other side. You see, the God you serve is not a sadist, nor is he a killjoy. He is a redeemer. That's right, amen. And he is thoroughly convinced to help you in your journey. All right. Galatians 2.20, Paul had a revelation of this. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, get ready. We're going to draw the sixth and final stage and it looks like this. Take the double parallel line and make it open up like the bell of a trumpet. And draw that arrow, victorious. Have yourself an Easter sunrise service just for your own resurrection. <laughs> and stage six authenticity is what I call this. Now, I want to be clear because in calling this stage six authenticity does not mean that the prior five stages you were inauthentic. Because when you were a warrior, you were being authentic to where you were yeah. at that time. Remember, we go from strength yes. to strength to strength. Yeah. Yes. So being those other things doesn't mean you are inauthentic in the other stages. But I'm using this word authenticity in the broadest sense of the term. Authenticity. Now, what does scripture say? David says, I will rejoice in your love. You saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to the enemy. But you have set my feet where? What's it say in the Bible? In a spacious place. Isn't this a beautiful picture? Because when you're here, see, being nailed to the cross, you're quite immobile. And you're like, God, into your hands, I commit my spirit. On the other side of that, God begins to open up a big dance floor. You're no longer walking a tightrope for Jesus. You are in a spacious place. You're in a big place. Now, I want to be very careful in the way I teach this. Because notice that it reaches up into the realms of ideal self and even into the depths of despised self. When you're here in life, the things of your warrior ideal self come to you easily. You don't have to strive. You don't have to prove or defend anything. You're just there. By the grace of God, they're, they're coming to you. Number two... The things of the old despised self no longer have a grip on you, no longer have a hold on you, okay? You, let me just put it this way. You can go places without sinning that you couldn't go before because there, the, the cross has had a very thorough work in your life. And I'm not talking about, yeah, being light with sin. I'm just saying 
you can move with great latitude and freedom because of, of your authentic self. Okay. This is the spacious place. Now, right now we're going to pause and I'm going to ask you to look at the map that you have. You should have that map right in front of you. I hope it looks something like this. And I'm going to ask you to answer this question. Where are you now? Not where do you hope to be? Not where you were a decade ago. Where are you now? And I'm going to ask you to take your pen or pencil and draw a little stick figure of yourself. Somewhere on the map, draw a little stick figure of yourself. It might be in a parking lot. No condemnation. If you're there, admit it. If you're in brokenness, no problem. If you're a warrior, draw that little stick figure there. Now, let me give you a warning. We tend to place ourselves further along on the map than we actually are. <laughs> Why? Because we're hopeful. Or because we're standing somewhere and we see the mountain range in the distance and we think we own it. No, you just see it from a distance. That's what, you're not standing on the mountain. You just begin to understand a little bit of it. So be, I'm going to answer that question in just a second. I'm going to answer that question in just a second. So try to the best of your ability, draw a little stick figure. If you have to hide your answer, I understand if you don't want to show the person next to you. Now, please draw that stick figure because it's the thinnest you will ever be. And don't lose the opportunity <laughs> to draw yourself is this wonderful stick figure. I'm like, mm. All right, the next page, the next page, we're going to run through this and uh, what we're going to do is I, I will offer a time for Q&A but because there's so much material here I wanted to just kind of get it out there and we'll have you stay after if you want to stay and ask some questions or have some dialogue I'd be more than happy to do that all right understanding the journey here's some things you need to know we tend to think that our current stage on our journey will be continue to be our experience forever wrong you are moving. Remember, your heart is on a pilgrimage. Everything that the Holy Spirit is doing is a forward movement in your life. You're going from glory to glory. You're moving. And now this could be good news or bad news, right? If you're a warrior, it's not that good news. If you're in stage four, at least you get to say, hey, things are going to get better. Next, we have a home stage, but can visit the other preceding stages in which we've already lived. The home stage is where you drew your stick figure. That's, your, that's where God has you in this journey uh, right now. That's fine. Let's call that your home stage. Now, for example, if you're stage three warrior, you still own stages one and two. They were built into who you are. So you can visit those stages. You never stop learning, for example. And you never stop celebrating the, the fact that you're saved. You're a warrior now, but those things are a part of you. Got it? One stage is not better or more spiritual than any of the others. Each has their important place. Sometimes when we see graduating numbers, stage one, two, three, four, we think, well, certainly the higher numbers are more spiritual. Yeah. Not true. Every stage has a glory of its own. Every stage is Im important and vital to move through in God's way and in God's time. Next. We tend to look down on others in earlier stages and misunderstand those in future stages. Wow. I came fresh out of Bible college into a church in southern Illinois. I was a youth pastor. I was on fire for God. And, of course, being a Bible college graduate, I had all the answers. So I was very happy to tell you them. <laughs> and I was ready to charge hell and extinguish it with a squirt gun. So that was me. I was that, I was that warrior. And uh, it was at a church, my, my sister and my brother-in-law, my late brother-in-law, were founding members of that church. And uh, he was in deep stage four brokenness. I had no language for where he was at. Yeah. But he was in deep, deep stage four brokenness. I remember coming to his house, and I was in his living room telling him about all these wonderful things the youth group is doing and all these great things God's doing through us. And he sat back on his lazy boy and said, Sonny, you are young and idealistic. Yeah. And man, that stung. Yeah. Not to be outdone, I said, Fred, you are old and burnt out. That's what you are. Yeah. What was going on there? 
The older said, yeah, I've been there, got that t-shirt. Yeah, I remember when I was that way, just like you. And I was looking at him saying, we got a hold of the best thing on earth. How come you're not in the game, buddy? We, we can often misunderstand people who are in different stages, just like this. By the way, Fred did not need my quips and my quick pat answers. He needed me to come alongside him, bind his wounds with oil and wine, sit with him and affirm his identity in Christ. That's what he needed. I did not have the means to do that, unfortunately, at the time. How well we're living our current life stage largely determines our success in the one to come. So wherever God has you in the journey, don't try to fast forward. You can't do it anyway, by the way. Be a student of your current life stage. And when, when you fully squeeze the sponge of that current life stage and allow yourself to cooperate with God's dealing of that current life stage, he'll move you ahead in one to come. All right. An axiom is a short statement of truth which captures a timeless principle. I'm going to give you these very quickly. And these are not necessarily in your notes, but I'll just throw them out there. Because if I had a moment to sit with people in each of these six stages of life, and if I had a second to tell them, here's some advice for you. This is the axiom I would give them. Mike Yoda. You are stuff God, you will be. <laughs> All right, stage one, celebrate grace. You know what? This is what you need to know. Is the grace that saved you, and grace will lead you home. Celebrate it, because God saved you, not by your own good works or merit, but by his amazing grace. This is not in your notes, so you won't find it there. Uh, number two, learn all you can. If you're in stage two, learn. Yeah, like I said, be at the church every time the doors are open. Open your Bible. Learn to read it for yourself. Learn to hear God for yourself. Uh, hey, you warriors in stage three, this is my word for you. Go for it. Don't apologize for your youthful zeal. You know, warriors are buoyant in faith. We got vision out the yazoo, and we're ready to go for it, okay? And you should go for it. Next. If you're in stage four, brokenness, hang on, don't give up. Now, I know that doesn't sound very glamorous. But sometimes just hanging on and being persistent is what victory looks like in stage four, brokenness. Number five, if you're in stage five, surrender, die well. Now, I know that sounds like the ultimate oxymoron because... We've seen people go through an invitation to their cross, and because they fight it, they're like a tiger in a cage. They're growling, they're scratching, they're tearing up everything in sight. People who are not dying well at God's invitation ruin marriages, they ruin churches, they ruin relationships, they ruin occupations, they ruin families, because they're fighting, fighting, fighting. My advice to you, if you're nearing stage five, is die well. Go back and read the Gospels. Read how Jesus died and model it. Number six, if you're in authenticity, stage six, live to give. Do not go into spiritual retirement, move to Arizona, drink iced tea, and play shuffleboard. Don't do it. We need you in the body of Christ to turn around and say, hey, let me grab you by the hand and, and just say, Here's some stories. Here's, here's what I learned when, when I was going through what, where you're at. And you know what? There's, there's joy in the spiritual life. There's victory at the end. Let's go through because each stage is glorious. Now, this is the most common question that I get whenever I teach this. How often do I have to go through this? Did you know that Western thought is very lineal, right? Just like even the map we just drew, it's very lineal. Stage, 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 all in a line. We tend to think that way. Eastern thought is cyclical. And by the way, the Bible that we know, love, and read is out of the East. So it's cyclical. So which is true? Both are true. And this is, this is what we have to understand. This is in your notes. You see that page with that big red circle? Draw, uh, take that and label it life, death, resurrection. 
This three-step process is going to unlock some tremendous help for us on our journey. Did you know life, death, and resurrection is the process of spiritual growth? It's the process that Jesus came to redeem us. Read Philippians 2, life, death, resurrection. This whole cycle is how you grow spiritually, it's how you go through challenges, and it's how you grow, sp- and this is woven in through nature and through the business realm and, and every realm. It's a spiritual truth and I call it a micro cycle because we go through this many times in our journey. This is why it's important. All right, if you're do- gonna talk about life, death, and resurrection lineally, okay, you could look at this whole idea lineally. How many times do I have to go through it? I would say one time, lineally. Uh, early on in our life, it's all about a discovery of great new life. In the middle, we go through some very serious death process and at the end, When we submit to that process, we come to a new resurrection. So yes, we go through that once, but I want you to see this. You see this in your handout? Mm -hmm. You go through microcycles many times in every stage of life. As a matter of fact, the more you can go through microcycles early on before stage four, the big one, the better off you will navigate stage four, the big one. Here's why. Have you ever heard of the term muscle memory? Muscle memory is what makes athletes great because they don't have to even think through how they shoot the ball or how they swing the golf club. And muscle memory, you have used muscle memory today. When you got in your car to drive here, you took that key, right? And you didn't have to look, now where's that darn hole? I gotta stick the key in. You know what, you've done it so many times, you take the key and you just stick it in there because you have muscle memory and where, or if you are fortunate and you have the button press start, you don't know, where is that button? I know that button's around here on the dashboard somewhere. No, you just go, okay, start the car. You've done it a hundred times and you've developed muscle memory. Microcycles give us spiritual muscle memory. And when we go through and cooperate with the process of life, death, and resurrection, and we realize that on the other side of every cross that we're introduced to, there is in fact a resurrection on the other side. When we go through that enough, we get spiritual muscle memory that when we're going through the big one, the big one, we say, wait a minute, God, this hurts. I'm confused and I feel like I'm about to fail and die and flame out. But I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna cooperate with you that there's a resurrection on the other side of this thing. Microcycles happen all through. Oh, let me tell you a quick story. I was teaching this in the great state of Ohio some years ago, and a young man right in Bible college, he was in Bible college, he was home visiting his parents, and he he was like all of 19 years old, and I taught this concept, and he said, oh, pastor, bro, I remember when I was up there, and I remember when I went through all that brokenness stuff, and I, bro, I remember when I went through all that. T- I was terrible. And I'm glad I came through to the other side of authenticity. Yes. I thought to myself, young man, <laughs> you might have stubbed your toe going up stage two stairs, <laughs> but you haven't taken the big one yet. See, what was going on in his life? He had just broken up with a girlfriend, and it felt like the big one because he, he defined that as life. I need to hold on to this relationship. God said, take it to the cross. He had to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Death. Hey, puppy love is real to the puppy. When we're going through a microcycle, when we're going through a process of death, I wanted to be, no, I'm not even going to tell you the stories, but I, you have stories of going through microcycles. Something you clung to, the Lord Jesus says, lay it down. Yeah. You lay it down, and he resurrects it supernaturally on the other side. You're like, mind blown. So this guy says, yeah, I've been through all of that. I've been through stage four. Well, he experienced a microcycle in Bible college. And that's the extent of it. Thank God for that. But there was so much more ahead of him. Now, it's important to understand that. Now, here's hope for you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident that this, that he who what began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. 
the Lord is totally committed to help you in your journey. And, and I hope through this talk, some light has been shown on the Grand Canyon of your life because some of you here are right at the cusp of something awesome and great and grand in God, but you can't see it yet. I said you can't see it yet. You can't perceive it, but it's right there. You're right close to it. And when we get some light on it, when we get some understanding on it, we begin to see, oh yeah, this is what God is doing in my life. So I'd like to pray for you. Especially if you are going through stage four brokenness or stage five surrender, I would encourage you to take the way of Christ. Maybe you're here today and you're going through a microcycle. You're going through something where you, the Lord's asking you to lay something down, let it die, and, and surrender some things, okay? That is a normative part of your spiritual life but you need grace to go through it. And I'm gonna pray for spiritual muscle memory to be formed in you. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, the Holy Spirit, just let the Holy Spirit touch you right now where you're seated. There are people going through brokenness, and because of this teaching today, they have a, an idea, they have words, they have an understanding of what's going on. Lord, they have realized that you have not abandoned them, nor have you forsaken them, but you're actually right in the middle of this painful process. Lord, for people who are going through microcycles of life, death, and resurrection, Lord, I pray that you'd give them spiritual muscle memory, that they would learn, that they would know everything that they need to know so that they can go through this and see a resurrection on the other side. In the name of Jesus, I thank you that you are a faithful God and you began a good work in these lives and you will carry it on to completion. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd keep us out of the parking lots, keep us from being spiritual fools, keep us close to your heart and cooperating with the activity of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' powerful name, and everyone said, amen. amen.